Welcome to the first of a series of innovation-focused webinars from Enterprise Ireland. I'm your host, Dave McCullen, and today's webinar is entitled Innovating in a Crisis. And to set the context and the theme for today's webinar, I thought there's a great quote attributed to John F. Kennedy that goes as follows. The Chinese use two brush strokes to write the word chaos. One brush stroke stands for danger, and the other stands for opportunity. So in a crisis, be aware of the danger, but recognize the opportunity. And today, we're fortunate to be joined by Irish innovators who did innovate in a crisis. CEO and founder of Monaghan-based CombiLift, Martin McVicker joins us, Chief Technology Officer of Hybrid, Hybrigene Diagnostics, Dr. Gary Keaton, and Senior Executive for Innovation, Innovation at Enterprise Ireland, David Keeley, all join us today. But before I let those guys introduce themselves, let's show you the agenda for today's webinar. So we're gonna start off with a brief introduction by each of our guests today. And then we're gonna talk about a key element in innovation, which is building capability before you need it. And then using setbacks effectively, because oftentimes constraints can be the very opportunity we need to innovate. Next, we're gonna talk about collaboration because no man is an island. So we need to actually work together to build new, new industries, new innovations, new products and services. Then David's gonna tell us, then we're gonna talk a little bit about the innovation and building the culture for innovation to thrive within organizations. And then David's gonna tell us a little bit about the supports available for Enterprise Ireland. And then it's gonna be over to you for a brief 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. Now I'm gonna hand over to our guests to introduce themselves, to give themselves full justice, and we're gonna keep this short to an elevator pitch. So we're gonna start with Martin, and then Gary, and then David to introduce each of themselves and what they do within their organizations. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, Aidan. Um, I'm Martin McVicker. I'm the co-founder CEO of CombiLift uh, with my business partner, Robert Moffat. We established CombiLift 22 years ago to develop and manufacture material handling equipment for very specific needs. Niche, we, I use the term niche markets. We don't make normal forklift trucks, we make forklift trucks to save our clients warehouse space and handle their products more safely. And we currently export to 85 countries worldwide and we employ just over 650 people here in our manufacturing plant here in County Monaghan. Brilliant, and over to you, Gary. Hi, I'm Gary Keating. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Hybridine Diagnostics. So we're a medical diagnostic company based in Sandyford here in Dublin, and we manufacture molecular diagnostic tests, which is to say that uh, we diagnose the presence of bacteria and virus which cause diseases by looking for the specific genetic fingerprint of the, uh, the sequence of those organisms within a human specimen. So we make a range of tests. At the moment, we have 13 tests, which you can see, Mark, which are for sale globally through a network of distributors. Uh, and here in Sandyford, we have 20 employees. Um, almost half of those are in R&D, so we're very much a, a research innovation focused organization. Fantastic. And David's going to introduce a little bit about what he does within Enterprise Ireland. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is David Keeley. I work as an innovation specialist in Enterprise Ireland. Um, I joined EI just over two years ago, and uh, before that, spent almost 20 years in industry working for both SMEs and multinationals in engineering, R&D, and innovation leadership roles. Fantastic. So I thought a great way to start today's webinar was with a quote by Mike Tyson. So Mike Tyson said, everybody had a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And this happened to all of us. Coming into this crisis, everybody had a plan. We all had a strategy and vision what was going to be 2020, and 2020 seems like it's gone on all of us. This was the same for each of you, and I thought it'd be helpful if each, each guest talked about what they were working on before, because I want to establish this, that while our guests today innovated in a crisis, this wasn't their plan. This came out of pivoting. This came out of building capability that they were able to use and pivot within the crisis. So Martin, I'd love if you'd share, what was your plan and then what happened when you got punched in the mouth? So I suppose like, like us all in, in business, you know, we're all, many many of us on this call, we're all focused on growth and, you know, we're all, like for Combilift as a business, we invest 7% of our revenue into R&D 
So we're continually developing new products for different niche markets. But I remember before this crisis really hit, I would say, Combilift and many other businesses in Ireland, Combilift, we exhibit at 92 trade shows worldwide to establish our brand. And I remember the first week of March, being out in Atlanta at one of our trade shows, Modex, with clients in the US. And on my way back thinking, you know what, this could be my last trip to the US this year because I mean, really COVID-19 was ramping up in Europe. The US was already in jittering about what was gonna happen. And it's starting and through your mind thinking, you know what, whatever your plans were for 2020, they're really being torn on his head. And, um, and the other thing on top of that, not only did I arrive back into Ireland, you know, the first week of March, but at that stage within CombiLift business, we had introduced a 14 day quarantine, which was very much started to be talked about in the media, but we had said that for any CombiLift employee that comes from abroad, either for work or otherwise, they needed to go into 14 days quarantine. And I'd sent that out on a YouTube message to our employees. So in fact, in reality, as I put myself into quarantine for 14 days, and that 14 days in quarantine really sort of put in perspective, you know what, as a business with the capabilities we've built up, how can we put it to really good use, both in the in short term, to help convert, you know, COVID-19. And that was sort of was the catalyst in terms of the innovation that we brought to market five weeks later, even. Brilliant. And we'll come back to that innovation as well, because I want to talk about that and how you guys pivoted within the crisis using that capability you talked about. But Gary, what were you working on? What was the plan before all of the sudden COVID hit? Yeah, I mean, very much uh, the story, I think, for everybody else. We, we had a plan and, and this wasn't it. So we have, uh, at the end of last year, we had 10 different diagnostic test products on the market. And our plan was to expand that range by launching the, the next two which were uh, STI tests. And at that point we were sort of done with new tests. We had identified uh, a gap in the market for very low cost automated tests. So our current tests, and we see this in a little while in terms of how they run, they're, they're quite simple to, to use. You get a patient sample at one end, you get a result at the other end. But there's a couple of steps in the middle that requires a laboratory uh, trained staff to perform a couple of manual steps. And we are currently involved in a project to miniaturize and automate that process. So it's a very simple uh, automated, what we call a sample to results in like an espresso machine. Uh, and that was our plan for 2020. Most of our budget and resource were, were aimed towards that and our planning. Um, and then we became aware um, through channels and also from some of our collaborators quite early in the process of the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we had started even sort of in January to, to realize this was a, a possible direction for me. But then obviously we had to we had to do all the other stuff. So we had to look at our work practices. We have 20 people here, so we can't afford to move everybody off site. Plus we have manufacturing and lab based uh, activities here, which have to be done on the premises. So we had to rationalize a little bit. Some people could work from home. We spread out across the building uh, and we limited the throughput into the lab so that we wouldn't have too many people working uh, in close proximity. But, you know, I think within the first three, three, maybe four weeks, at one stage, I think we had 25% of our small staff off the premises. Luckily, nobody got sick. We had people who had to quarantine because they arrived back into the country just as uh, part of it. We had people who were living with people who had been close contacts of, of positive. So well, that was a very significant hit um, at the time. So we had to make sure that we could function with, with a, a skeleton staff really. Fantastic. And we'll come back to how you innovated using that capability. Martin, you mentioned that time you had in lockdown where you had that 14 days to think and to contemplate and let all these ideas marinate. And I heard you say a few years ago, your ambition for CombiLift was to become a billion euro business. So obviously, like the Mike Tyson quote, you got punched in the mouth and COVID-19 threw loads of stumbling blocks in the path towards that billion. But it didn't stop you. You looked at the existing capabilities from Combula, from your staff, from your mindset, from that culture of innovation, and you came up with a brand new product. I'd love if you share what your innovation in a crisis is. Yeah, and, and thanks, David. And I know even you know around that early March time, it didn't matter whether you're, whether you're in Ireland or in the US or anywhere in Europe. Though in the media, 
those major concerns about COVID-19 and the potential lack of ventilators in every country. And there was different government incentives. You know, if you look at the United Kingdom, they were encouraging companies like Dyson, GSEB, several other companies to develop and manufacture ventilators to cope with the lack of them. In the US, you'd, you had, you had uh, North America encouraging companies like General Motors, NASA to design and manufacture ventilators. And I've been thinking to myself, you know, for Ireland as a country, you know, is there some way Combilift could come to the table and, and help to solve the ventilator shortage or the potential shortage even in Ireland and further afield? So I made contact with the Irish HSE through Monaghan Cavan. And on the 23rd of March, I'd arranged a, a non site visit in Monaghan Hospital with uh, Ronnie McDermott from the HSE. And he showed myself and, and three of my other colleagues how a ventilator actually operates. Because as you can appreciate, in all our businesses, manufacturing ventilators was not our core business. Making forklift trucks, material handling equipment is very much in our DNA. And we used the opportunity to, to really analyze a ventilator and see how it work, how it operates. But there's one thing about our culture of innovation. We don't just look at maybe what's out there. You know, we don't make normal forklift trucks. We, we specifically design forklifts to solve handling issues. When we looked at a ventilator, we weren't looking at a ventilator to see how can we imitate it and make it. We were looking at its functionality. How can we optimize its functionality? And how can we help to solve the potential challenge? And of course, the challenge out there was not black and white saying it's a lack of ventilators, but when you narrow down and, and when you look more into the detail, the challenge was we would not, we potentially could run out with the possibility of ventilating enough patients. Because when you think of it, that's really the goal of a ventilator is to ventilate a patient. So we thought to ourselves, you know, understand how a ventilator works and looking at the flow rates in Monon Hospital, we could figure out quite early on that a standard branded ventilator had enough flow rate to ventilate multiple patients. And that very much was the catalyst for us to say, rather than manufacturing ventilators from scratch, why don't we develop a splitter device where we can split the ventilator to do multiple patients? And when we looked at that concept, we seen back in 2015, it was used in a few medical hospitals where doctors in the medical profession had done it temporarily, and they actually had saved some lives, but it had never gone into production anywhere because there was challenges in that the doctor didn't know exactly what patient A and patient B would get. So we said to ourselves, if we can develop a system where we can both control and measure the exact flow for patient A and patient B. So it was, it was very much analyzing the problem and designing a solution rather than just going and manufacturing something for the sake of it, Aidan. Yeah, and I love the, this is a common theme throughout all your business with CombiLift that you create solutions and then you look for a problem for the solution you've created and you did this again and this is the mindset that's so key in innovation is yes you may have created a solution but you need to sell that to some problem out there and you certainly did that within this crisis but moving on to hypergene gary you've brought 13 products to the market you mentioned it then earlier on and you started with this non-invasive rapid test for bacterial meningitis and you had many stumbles on the way to bring in those products. You understood the marketplace. And this is what we're talking about when we say build capability before you need that capability. And you certainly had a, had a lot of capability built. So when the crisis hit, your team were ready, your mindset was ready and enhanced. Yeah, absolutely. So to a certain extent, the, the, the COVID test that we launched last month was the culmination of uh, a sort of stepwise set of developments we've been working on since 2014 when we started operations uh, for real here. So uh, our very first test was a test for um, bacteria that causes the most dangerous kind of bacterial meningitis uh, called the meningococcal disease. Um, and our test for meningococcal disease uh, essentially required, uh, required us to develop a means of making a very, very fast way of identifying the DNA of, of, of that bacteria, multiplying it many millions of times, uh, generating a light signal that we could read to uh, allow our instrumentation to say yes or no that the, the bacteria is there. Um, and that was all part of the work we did in the first year. 
But that first product, when it came to market, required us to do uh, an offline sample clean. So that will come down to the lab, typically a blood sample or, or a number puncture sample. Um, and that would have to go through a third party process to strip away everything except the, the DNA, the nucleic acid within that sample. And then we could, we could run it. Um, and really from that point on, we started to, 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 to build the capability of, of, of our technology because we realized that we actually had a very fast way of, of binding to and multiplying these bacterial viral targets and generating a very rapid result, uh, typically positive results in our system up within five to 20 minutes, so very, very quick. But we were losing that by, by doing this offline purification. So um, from that point, we removed that. We went to direct testing. So we very, very crude uh, sample comes down to the lab. And we typically just dilute it down slightly, boil it up on a small heat plug, and add it on board our instrument. Um, we have a little video uh, of the current COVID test. So I don't know if we can run that while I'm just uh, outlining the, the developments from that point forward. Um, so. We, we we moved away from that what we call an extraction process to a system where you simply take the, the sample and you process it very simply in the lab. And uh, we also changed the software on our small portable instrument to allow us to give it the result as soon as the result was called positive. So then we had a very very rapid way of calling causing these positive results. Um, and at that point, we were very much uh, a one product company. We went, then when we realised we had to build a menu. And we looked at other opportunities where this sort of rapid diagnostics were, were, were really relevant. Um, we discovered then, having launched a couple of products, that really just giving one answer wasn't always sufficient. So we had to change the technology so that within a single test, we could identify up to two different potential bacteria or viruses. Uh, that was very important in bacteria where there are two, two bacteria which cause about 90% of the pain. Uh, cases, so that sort of multiplex technology drove us on. Um, at that point, we realised in order to to really try to grow the market, we needed to go after some of the big hitter, the the big tests that are performed often in the hospital lab. One of those is flu. Um, very significant number of flu tests performed every year, every flu season, um, and that required us to be able to detect not bacterial genetic material, but viral genetic material which is quite different. It's a different kind of molecule and it changes quite often, which is why you've got to get the flu jab every year. Um, so we started our flu development um, before last and we had to retool again to do that. So by the time we came to the COVID crisis, we already had a very simple way of handling samples. We already had the capacity to handle these respir respiratory viruses. We already had a sample handling process that was suitable for the sort of swab samples that the World Health Organization were telling people to use. So it, it was serendipitous to a certain extent, it was you know, serendipitous on the back of four or five years of hard work to incrementally build out the, the capacity of our, of our tests uh, and end up with something where um, the, at the moment the sample comes down to the lab, there's a simple dilute step, goes on board, it goes into our freeze dried reagents which we manufacture here in Sandyford and then it goes on board our small portable instrument. Um, it can all be done very, very simply. A small amount of real estate on the lab, which um, and means that this uh, the ability to rapidly diagnose COVID isn't limited to the large central laboratory we're running hundreds of these at the same time, but uh, but also we're able to get out there to, to smaller hospital labs who don't currently have this sort of capacity. I see, the video is still running, but uh, <laughs> this is just an example of what it looks like. Um, so it's a very small. Uh, smaller than the footprint of, of, of a laptop, and all of our tests, all of our 13 tests run on this. Um, so we can we can kill it now if we want, or we can uh, we can see the, the little picture of how the the light signal generated. So, so it, it's very interesting that both your businesses have really focused on the customer and solving the problem. So Martin, I, I'd love Denise if you would in the background maybe show Martin's video because. CombiLift did a very similar thing. Martin said this. It's not just forklifts, it's for the very limited space. And we think where technology is going when these dark factories, we've, see, we've already seen Amazon fulfilling centers, they're getting tighter and tighter. So space is becoming a premium. So with that change, actually designing for the customer becomes absolutely key. And we can see that here with the Combi ventilator. And Martin, feel free to give us any comments over this video. 
perfect, Aidan. So you can see in this little video here, in the middle you have a standard branded ventilator, and the product we have developed is an attachment that attaches to a conventional ventilator. And not only does it attach to it, but it has its own control system, it has its own electronic flow valves. So in reality is we can actually both control the flow to patient A and patient B, the same as a medical profession person can do on a, on a branded ventilator. So what we're really using, we're using the heart, if you want to call the middle is really the pump, the ventilator, and then we're actually dividing it like a, if you want to call it like a flow divider, but it's not just a flow divider, we can individually control the flow to patient A and patient B, depending on their lung size. In medical terms, it's the tidal volume that goes to patient A, patient B. And very much, we were building on our capability, our in-house, and I use the term mechatronics, you know, the combination of mechanics and electrics. We brought 17 of our engineers together. Some of them were actually working on our newest AGV products. You know, when we brought together the capability of what we have in-house. And usually, when you look outside your own field, you can actually, the, the core competency you have can actually be translated into many other industries, even though a lot of us think we can only stay in our own vertical sector, but that capability can be brought into other industries. And, you know, medical devices was not a core product of Tommy Lift in any shape or form. So it took this crisis to sort of trigger that in our mind. But you can see here, the operator is actually deciding what flow rate goes to a patient. So not only we electronically, it'll actually automatically adjust using electronics. Um, and it's actually a very, it's a very, well, we, from its infancy, from the development, we from initially looking at the unit in modern hospital, we had a finished product operating within five weeks on test with the Royal College of Surgeons in Bowman Hospital. So, and that's one of, within our DNA, it's time to market is important from an innovation R&D because many companies can invest heavily in R&D, but if your time to market is so long, your competitors end up getting there before you. And in the forklift truck industry, normal forklift, man larger forklift manufacturers may take three years to get a product to market. We very much focus on getting a product to market within 12 months. And that drive to get it to market really helped us to get this combi ventilator completed within a, a short time frame and thankfully Ireland PHC didn't need combi ventilators thankfully we, we had a lack of them but as we speak there's a major demand actually in South America so we already have a major interest and product actually going to South America currently to deal with COVID-19 and it's not you know, we very much set this up as a non-for-profit business because we didn't want to be profiting on the back of COVID-19 but it really has got us into the medical device sector that we wouldn't be in other ways. And, and I think the capability that we have demonstrates that every business's capability can translate into many other sectors, Aidan. Yeah, and that is such a core message that we'd like to get across from this webinar is that not every experiment is gonna work out financially. You're not gonna have a return on investment, but you will have a return on capability. And like Martin said here, sometimes looking not just to best practices, yes, be best in your class, best practices, but also look at best principles. So draw those knowledge from other fields where you can innovate within those fields like Convilift have shown. David, I wanted to come to you because history teaches us that great periods of innovation often follow crises. And we've seen this from the Black Death, to the Spanish flu, and certainly, we're going into this, whatever it's going to be when it emerges, when we go back to the way things are. It's not going to be a new normal, it's just going to be the way things are. And we have to be optimistic here. And you have a very broad view of many Irish organizations, both at home and abroad, or operating abroad. What is your view? What are you seeing? Because I know you're passionate about this idea of innovation mm -hmm. in the crisis. Yeah, thanks, Aidan, and, and you're completely right. Um, and in fact, we wouldn't have many of the advances in society and technology we have today without those crises in, in, in history. Um, in this current crisis, we're seeing some really interesting and distinct trends in innovation, not only in our client base, <clears throat> but also internationally. 
uh, in many cases, and, and the guys kind of spoke to this, and so did you, innovation plans and strategies are being radically altered. Many projects that were near term um, have had to be, be postponed or cancelled, and more disruptive or transformative ideas or projects are being brought forward. Um, but overall, we're seeing two distinct and, and equally important um, concurrent innovation responses to, to the crisis from our clients and international peers. And again, this is reflected in, in, in what the two guys have just talked about. Uh, the first type is what we might term uh, reflex innovation. These are uh, immediate or near-term projects that are designed to help organizations sustain themselves through the immediate shock and assist with the national effort to manage the crisis. Uh, we've seen a huge volume of activity in this area. Uh, for example, uh, many of our clients have done amazing jobs in innovating their supply chains or operations uh, to source or design uh, and manufacture things like PPE or medical equipment, like the, the, the two products the guys you just have to talk about. Um, and that's with the help of the national and international response to, to COVID. Uh, and personally, from my point of view, it's been incredible to see such a massive collective effort from our clients in this area. Um, also, many of our clients are assessing our lean supports take the opportunity to optimize their competitiveness and performance as the volume of business begins to pick back up. Uh, and we've also seen a huge move towards companies digitalizing their customer delivery service and engagement channels to cope with social distancing. Um, and this is an exhaustive list. You know, some of the things we're seeing is seeing in this area in, in, in the immediate response. Uh, the second type of innovation response we've seen and, and expect to see more of is adaptive innovation. And these are longer term activities designed to help uh, organizations uh, choose the most effective innovation options to adapt to the post-crisis world or the, or the new normal as we might call it. Um, many of our clients are exploring different types of innovations in response to the, in response to the crisis. These are types of innovations that maybe are new to them um, and maybe types that they haven't used before like business model innovation or actually new types of products or services that are geared around new types of opportunities or or new industries are indeed more focused on user experience. Um, and again, we might not yet know what the post-crisis world looks like, but the picture is emerging a little more every day, and many companies are focusing on building key innovation capabilities that they might need in the future to succeed. And, and fundamental to this is the ability to bring up-to-date intelligence into their innovation decision-making process. And for support in this area, I really couldn't recommend highly enough making use of our market research center facility. There's also been some fantastic work done by my sector colleagues around the world in preparing some excellent insight reports on how international markets are reacting to the crisis and where the opportunities might be. And these can be found on our global ambition website. And we also have some amazing, inspiring case studies about how some of our clients are innovating in response to the crisis. And these can be found on our Irish Advantage website. Fantastic. I wanted to move to our next agenda item next, which is collaboration. And one of the reasons collaboration, we hear about it much, much more at the moment, is because of the speed of change. And in a way, it's the decline of expertise. So while we can be very expert in our swim lanes, we need to start collaborating with each other more and more. And we can do that more with SaaS models or small products that we can call upon from time to time. But there's a great quote by Charles Darwin that's always used in the context of innovation, that it's not the strongest of the species who survive, but the one that's most adaptable to change. There's a lesser known quote, which is in the long history of humankind and animal kind too, those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. And it is so relevant in this marketplace that we're in, in this business world that we're in, in the world that we're in today, that we need to collaborate more and more. And Gary, I thought I'd come to you first because Hypergene was born from collaboration, not only from your first products, but from an ecosystem perspective. And Royal Hospital Belfast and EI, with their feet on the ground, brought brought you together to give birth to Hypergene in some way. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the genesis of the company back in, in, in 2014 was a test for this bacterial meningitis. Um, product which developed in the lab in Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast. And um, it was very much a lab based test, but our, our, our job was to take that and make it something that we could put in a box that we could ship to China, we could ship to uh, Taiwan, and, and, and that, would, that would have a, a performance and, and shelf life. Um, but that was the start of a collaboration with Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast, but also in, in our 
in a particular field of work, it's very necessary to have these collaborations to, to road test the products, for example. So we have a, a product with the Streptococcus, which is a bacteria that's very important in childbirth. Uh, but 25% of pregnant women have this bacteria in their birth canal. It's not something damaging, but there is a significant risk of passing it on to a child during childbirth. And in that case, there is a small but very real risk of, of, of damage. In fact, it's the leading cause of neonatal meningitis. So in order to be able to develop a uh, a product to, to rapidly detect that bacteria, antibiotics can be given during delivery and essentially eliminate the risk of transmission. Uh, we paired up with Hollow Street. Um, you know, at the time, probably still, a couple of years ago, they were the busiest maternity hospital in Europe. Uh, so we, we had a collaboration with them where we, we, we ran a swab samples on pregnant women uh, arriving for natal visits and we were able to validate um, the results of that. Um, we also have uh, recently um, had very fruitful collaboration with uh, the Matter Private Hospital for the clinical validation of our, of our, of our COVID test. And these sort of collaborations, as well as generating the data that we can that we can sit behind, they also give us really important soft data, if you like, uh, how the customers really feel when they're running the test, which bits of it they like, which bits of it they don't like. They they inform tweaks in software, tweaks and tweaks in handling. Um, so that's all that's all really critical. Of course, with without the, the, the supports on the financial and the marketing front and they have any value and enterprise Ireland have been really hugely important to us. We're identified as a hypertension startup you know, back in the inception of, of the of the business. Um, and we have been in the seat of funding, which has been really, really important to us um, from, from a couple of channels through Enterprise Ireland. But equally important, I think, has been the supports that we've received. Um, David has mentioned the access to, to market research reports. We're a small company here in Santa Cruz, 20 people, and we don't have deep pockets. So anything that facilitates understanding the market and also accessing the market through the net EI network um, globally is, is really, really valuable to us. It's something that we'll be able to do. Um, and we've also been fortunate in, in the last couple of months, we, we led a consortium that, that uh, was awarded a Horizon 2020 European grant of almost a million uh, euro for the, the COVID development and the further of the project, uh, the product and extension of the field of use. Um, and in, you know, we've been there, there, about in a couple of Horizon 2020 calls, um, and the support of, of Enterprise Ireland with their experts to understand what, well, first of all, what calls are available, where is this European money available, uh, when, when are the right times to apply, but also to give us feedback very importantly on where our applications were weak, where they were strong, and definitely um, contributed massively to the success in achieving this funding for, for the COVID project. Fantastic. Martin, I love your collaboration story because it goes in different ways and one of the ones I'd love to share is your collaboration with education because you're very much focused on the next phase of employees coming into the business, that's one. But the other then is how EI helped you with your global ambitions as well. I'd love if you shared that one as well, please. Yeah, and, and I think that word collaboration, and, and I think Aidan, you've summarized it quite well, within Combilift, we try to collaborate with as many different avenues that, that can help to both strengthen our brand and our presence in front of our customers. But if you take in terms of the people development in our business, you know, we realized as a company five years ago, it was going to be more challenging to find skilled people to build the products we're manufacturing here in Monaghan. So we were, we were one of the first companies in Ireland to develop, not only develop, but in collaboration with Monaghan Cav and ETB to develop the first industry-led traineeship. And it was very much, it's a one-year program. We already have uh, had, I think, about 90 graduates through this program. Both other people had maybe decided this was a better career than they were in, but a lot of them were actually after doing their leave insert. And with that collaboration, the individual spent 50% of the time on the, in our business and 50% in the classroom. So that really and, and that really was the catalyst two years ago where we very much pioneered along with the mid-tier engineering group in Ireland the OEM apprenticeship and thankfully with Enterprise Ireland because of that collaboration with the mid-tier engineering group it was very easy for us to develop a content for an apprenticeship program which was a, approved by the apprenticeship council because 
it wasn't an apprenticeship just developed for Convolute. It was developed around the needs of 22 businesses we came together, all the manufacturing companies, which will add value to other businesses. So I think that collaboration in developing education, uh, either apprenticeships or other kind of educational modules, is really going to be key into the future because traditional ways of education is not going to help our businesses to get to the next level because it's all about innovation and education really needs to be at the forefront of our businesses and i think the closer companies collaborate with the education system the better it's going to be for us as a, as a, as a country going forward also and um, our collaboration with enterprise ireland very much started 22 years ago and a lot of that would have been even focused on our r d like enterprise ireland have been very supportive in terms of support and R&D investment over the years. Of course, getting into new international markets, we're now exporting to 85 countries worldwide. And I probably would know Enterprise Ireland people by name in at least 40 countries worldwide. So it's not that I just know them by email communication. I've met them. You know, they will, you know, they're very open to come and meet us at customer sites. And I, and I think you know, when you look at Enterprise Ireland, there's a lot of, we call it boots on the ground or feet on the ground in these overseas markets. And the more as businesses we explain to Enterprise Ireland personnel what we're doing, the better value they can bring us. So that whole collaboration, so I'm really using them as, as a, if you want to call it, using it's probably a strong word, but in terms of as a marketing person in them overseas market to help to build our brand. But I think, you know, collaboration goes everywhere, even in developing, the Combi Ventilate, it was very much our collaboration with the Irish KHSE really helped us to get the product right because I think no matter who we have in our R&D departments, we can't design a product to suit a customer without our customer collaborating in that development. Um, I know Gary was referring to some European funding. We've recently applied through Eureka, a European fund, and we're partnering up with a Belgium company to develop automatic gated forklift trucks, so automated forklift trucks, and I know Enterprise Ireland have been very supportive in that and, and going forward also. So I mean that whole collaboration, and, and it's, it doesn't, it shouldn't just stop with collaboration with one university, in fact on our ventilator project we collaborated with NUA in Galway, so I mean I think the collaboration we need to be open-minded, not just the fixed channels that we, we've known in the past, we need to be open-minded to collaborate in, in many different directions. Fantastic, and uh, we've lots of questions coming in. We're going to come to those questions in the last 15 minutes or so. But David, I wanted to come to you because collaboration is essentially what your role is, and it's core to your job. You both help clients when they need to collaborate and find other people to work with, but also you get ahead of their needs and come to them with suggestions. I'd love if you share how EI works in this respect. Yeah, thanks, Ian. I mean, I mean we have a huge uh, amount of emphasis on supporting our clients in collaboration. And this is because our analysis continuously shows that clients who collaborate in innovation tend to have better overall innovation capabilities and performance. Not only that, but the companies that collaborate in innovation usually export more. Um, collaboration is only one of the innovation capabilities that we're, we're helping to build and support in, in our clients. Indeed, our objective is to help our clients develop their innovation capabilities across the board. And our strategy is to be grounded in this principle. And actually, one of the things that we're currently looking at is ways to help clients easily self-assess their innovation capabilities and put improvement plans in place. Um, on collaboration supports, we, we have a range of them to, to help companies. These can range from those designed to help with collaboration in an early stage, when companies are trying to raise awareness and understanding of important areas like technology trends. And I think Martin talked about the mid-tier group, which is, which is a great example of that. Uh, and, and, and then on to those collaboration supports designed to help uh, companies actually collaborate on projects with both research bodies and other companies. And, and collaborating with, with, with research organizations and companies, both of these types of collaboration are actually important. Um, some examples of, of some key supports we have in this area, in this project support area, are um, innovation vouchers. Um, these are a good starting point for any company in collaborative innovation. And they consist of 5,000 euro vouchers that can be used to collaborate in small projects with research organizations, including our own technology gateway network and technology centers. Um, and then we've got innovation partnerships, which are larger scale funding for more advanced research collaborations. 
And then Horizon 2020, which has been renamed to Horizon Europe, I think, next year, um, which the guys talked about. And this, this is the European Union's programme for research and innovation for great growth. And, and just to say, that recently announced that eight Irish startups and SMEs were awarded 31 million in funding through this programme in the most recent, uh, most recent round, which was 10% of the total European-wide funding. Uh, so we're punching above our weight and credit must go to the companies involved, the DAs involved, and especially to our Horizon 2020 programme team here in Enterprise Ireland. Fantastic. And one last thing I want to come to before we go to our audience for some Q&A is probably the most essential thing of all that's been overlooked for so long, which is culture. And there's a great kind of mindset when it comes to culture that a farmer does not make crops grow. It doesn't say grow crops. It actually, a good farmer creates the environment for the crops to grow. And it's the same for innovation. It's the same for ideas. It's the same for positivity within an organization because we're, when we're happier, we're more innovative and we come, better to, we come forth with better solutions. And I'd love to come to each of, of you, much like we did with the elevator pitch because we're running out of time, to talk about just how important culture is to promote innovation within your organizations. So maybe Ed, we'll like, we'll like Martin, off. I mean, from, from, yeah, from a combative perspective, I mean, um, you know, I, I totally agree. You know, the, we, every business has the culture, whether we, we know it or not, and that culture develops within an organization. And I would say within our business, we very much focus on the culture of a can-do attitude. And that can-do attitude really is the backbone of our innovation R&D, because if you have a positive attitude, you know, your people are open to solving the challenging challenges that appear, but also within innovation, when we have our dealers and our customers visiting our plant, we very much encourage them to meet our engineers, even if the engineers are not working on a project for them. You know, we want our engineers to meet customers, I say every day, which is not happening because of COVID-19, but we encourage it as much as possible because what we're designing has to be for a customer somewhere in the world. And the more the more our engineers and our personnel meet customers, not just our engineers, but on the factory floor, they meet customers, they understand the value of what they're doing. It's bringing value to the customer that gets the product. And it puts our people in the mains of our customer shoes that would they be happy with the product they're getting? Is it solving their need? Are we delivering a quality product? So that whole culture for us, it, it's key. And I think every business, we have our own individual cultures. And my advice is not to try and change it overnight because you won't change a culture overnight, but it's it's picking the strengths from it and, and really uh, targeting them strengths because that can make all our business successful if we focus on the on the strengths within our culture. And that can help to get rid of the, the ones that are not strengths as such. So. Fantastic. And Gary, maybe a word on the culture in hydrogen. Yeah, I'd say it's not something I've given a, an awful lot of conscious thought to in terms of the, the, the culture around innovation here, because it's sort of what we do. And the obvious the obvious pun there is that it's in our DNA, but I think Martin's already used that one. But um, <laughs> you know, just thinking about it, there's a couple of things. I mean, I think first of all is you have to have the infrastructure to identify where the innovations will come from. So you have to identify, you know, if it's a customer need, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a new development, uh, uh, like 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 the COVID situation, you have to have infrastructure there. So that can be through, you know, in our case, a technical advisory group, or through the marketing department, or through a lot of those collaborations we mentioned earlier. Um, but and and Martin put a very positive spin on it there in terms of positivity. But uh, I mean, Mike, there's a quote from Niels Bohr, who was one of the fathers of of quantum physics, who said, "An expert's person has made every every mistake that can be made in a very narrow field." Um, and to a certain extent, that R&D, you know, it can be a nutritional business. You know, going to develop, you go to uh, you know, our most recent development here for COVID. We in, in three months we turned around a test for for, for COVID-19 development that was clinically validated. Um, and and we mistake to think that that was easy. Um, are there any developments that are easy? You'll encounter problems, and maybe most of what you try to do to circumvent the problems won't work. So you really need a huge amount of resilience within not just the research and development area, but also within the organization. And understanding that the mistakes you've made in the past are actually a capital for your R&D organization. And they, will, they, they will help you solve the next problem. I think that the final part of it is 
need somebody to, to implement the old adage of the perfect being the enemy of the good. Somebody's got to say at some point, no, th this is good enough. This meets the customer requirements. Otherwise, the development cycle goes on forever. So you have to have an organization which is slightly forgiving of the fact that there will be issues. We're ready to say, no, this is good enough. Let's go. What is Fantastic. And yeah, it's that psychological safety within the organization for people to call out when an idea is good, but also when it's not so good. David, from your perspective, the final word on how innovation and collaboration go hand in hand. Yeah, so so this is an area of massive interest for me, and it probably deserves a, a webinar in its own right. So I'll try not to do a dive in it, and I know we want to get to the questions and answers. But I absolutely love that, that quote from, from Drucker, and I know it's used a lot. But anybody who's ever worked on strategy can, can totally understand it. You can spend your time uh, de developing a great strategy, and if you don't take into account the culture, you're not going to go anywhere. Um, and, and, and especially innovation, culture plays such an important, even pivotal role in, in fueling organizations' performance and innovation. Companies just won't perform to the same level as those that nurture and develop cultures where openness and sharing of new ideas is encouraged in every organization. Not just your your R and D team or your or your engineering team, um, and where, where employees feel that their ideas will be actioned, so they get a fair crack of the whip, and where they're recognised for their innovation and contribution. Uh, the issue often isn't the lack of ideas, um, as, as maybe you, you might have said. Um, and I think I, 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 you know I was going to talk about your most recent one of your blogs where you talked about this farming to innovation culture analogy. I thought it was excellent, you know, that I think you put it that ideas of the sea and culture of the and, and culture of the organization of the soil. You know, that's that's brilliant. So even if you have the best seeds in the world, when they place in the wrong soil, they simply don't grow. So that sums it up really well, I think. Um, and when I've worked and observed companies with strong innovation cultures, it's always amazed me just how many good sometimes ideas come from staff at all levels. Um, staff are engaged because they feel part of the innovation process and they know that good ideas will be recognised in action. Uh, it allows companies to tap into a massive wealth of creative problem solving, um, resulting in ideas that can have a significant trans transformative outcomes that might not have ever been even voiced, let alone heard, without a culture to enable that to happen. Um, internal, internal and external collaboration plays a key role in helping develop a culture of innovation. One of the most effective things that companies can do is to collaborate with other companies that have strong cultures of innovation to learn from them. It's a, it's a short circuit way to actually have, have a big impact on, on your own company culture. Um, but another thing that companies can do is to make some interesting tactics and techniques that they can adopt. And, and behavior enablers is, is a big area here. And I, I'm not going to do a deep dive on, on the, the theory stuff here, but it, it's a really interesting area that we might talk about at another uh, uh, webinar, but, but I'll give one really good and relevant example of this that um, I was lucky enough to go and visit Martin's new facility uh, recently. Uh, and every, anybody who's, who's lucky enough to visit, Martin's very generous with his time and, and hosts a lot of events there. Um, it's a very large and spacious uh, modern facility, but yet the stairway um, to, to the, to the floor, floors actually terminates in the middle of the engineering office. And it's not a mistake. It's an amazing and enabler to get every member of staff uh, visiting to, to talk to visiting customers and other members of staff as they have to walk through the engineering office. And it encourages that dialogue, that sharing of ideas with people who are actually designing solutions. And it's only one, one of the many things, big and small, that CombiLift and, other, and indeed other clients do to help nurture a culture of innovation to great effect. Fantastic. And I heard about this idea, Martin, as well, about the uh... Pixar did this, so Steve Jobs did this when he, when he bought Pixar, was the biggest problem they had was people staying within their silos and not getting out of their offices. So they put the canteen right in the middle, so everybody had to come <laughs> out of their, 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 their silos. And I, I often think of the idea of the watering hole in nature where the lion and the antelope will drink peacefully and then they'll go back and they'll, they'll war against it you're out in the wild again. But some of the questions coming in, a lot, a lot of questions coming in on culture. But I'm going to jump to one because there's a very valid one here. How, and a general one for anybody who wants to take this one. How do you decide how much effort and or resources to invest into innovation? Very good question. And maybe if I kick it off, Ian, if you don't mind. Um, I, I, I know it depends on the size of your business. 
you know, and, and if you're a startup business or you're you're at a certain scale, um, I know for our business model today, we we make a conscious decision that because we develop a, we have a, many verticals in our product, like we don't make one model of combi lift forklift. We have 22 models or, or 21 models of vehicles today, and but we have purposely said we want to make sure that 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 model type has the possibility of, of generating, and, and, and I mean, I know every business has set up its own, but putting a monetary value that that product model needs to be fit to bring 5 million of turnover to the business within a three year period, or potentially, you know, to, so I think you need to put a monetary value to say, if I invest in this in R&D, what can it bring to the company? Um, because, you know, we can go down rabbit holes where we're developing a product for the sake of one market, need but we want to know there is some potential there and for us it doesn't mean they all work out perfect but i mean thankfully many of them do exceed the the, the turnover threshold the ones that don't we have cut a few products loose later on you know we've built them we've maybe kept them in the portfolio for five years and then we make the decision just to cut it loose because there's no you know if we're all in businesses that want to grow and scale and we've only always a certain number of resources so we have to make choices, but I think you need to really look at, will the investment in that R&D bring you some value and revenue based on the size of business you are at that time? Fantastic, and there's one come in, um, Gary, I think this one's relevant to you because it's about how do you deal with failures? And what I'm gonna take from that is the failures from products that don't work, like Martin said, they don't all make it. And you had this within, you mentioned the Niels Bohr quote, uh, so I thought, think this was, relevant for you, Gary, is oftentimes in those early days in Hybergene, you had products that didn't quite work, the market didn't accept them, et cetera. So how, as a culture, as a board, as a, a senior leadership team, did you deal with that and keep going? Yeah, and I think what, what Mark says to the previous question is very relevant there. First of all, you need to understand, you know, what's the market potential of, of, of the product that, you, that you're working on. Um, and, and then you have to understand, as I said before, that, that there are going to be that there's going to be failures. Probably most of the things you try aren't going to work until you get until you get to a place where you know usually you you can fix it, but sometimes you can't. Um, and sometimes that sometimes that's not that you can't fix the product, but that the product that you got out was was not right. Um, so two two answers to that really. In the first instance, I think you need to de-risk the process as you go through it. So we, you know our industry is very tightly regulated, so we have a a, a very codified design control program. Or a set of procedures. So we go through early stage design, feasibility to make a prototype. Then we go to a verification phase, and then finally we turn on product validation, making full scale batches. As you get through that process, it's costing you more money. So earlier in the process, you should be able to make that whole note call uh, before you before you spend a lot of a lot of money, a little bit more time on the bench. So we had a, we have we had certainly have had instances in the past where we've had great ideas for products. Um, this simply just wouldn't work. It was value was not going to be there for us to to, to continue to try to, to spin them out because they just go beyond the capabilities of technology. So it's important to understand that failure sometimes is just because you're trying to make something do something it can't do. So there's no shame in that. You give up and you say that's not going to work. The other side of it is get a product out which you know in and of itself works very well, but then the market accepts it's not what it's going to be. And we had, a, we had a certain amount of, of experience in that. I mean, our first product um, for um, molecular uh, detection of the bacterial meningitis, we have a product that we developed very early, which detects it from a throat swab. Um, so normally when a child goes in with query bacterial meningitis, you do a lumbar puncture, very invasive, it can be dangerous, it's very painful and um, to get some cerebrospinal fluid out of the spine. Uh, we, can, we can diagnose that from, um, from a throat swab, but the clinical guidelines, which we thought was a fantastic idea, the clinical guidelines don't support this. The clinical guidelines tell the doctor, if you have a suspicion that a child has bacterial meningitis, hook them up to antibiotics straight away, find out whether you're all right afterwards. Um, and we've just now, we started, I think we launched this product in 2016. In 2017, we started a longitudinal study with three NHS hospitals, and we've just got the results back, which show that our test is as good as the lumbar puncture test across 260 kids that were, that were suspect for but in that period since 2016, we haven't been able to sell much of that product because we didn't have the evidence base. We didn't have the ability to change what the doctors were, were being told to do. 
So that was a failure, if you like, from a commercial perspective, which may yet turn out to be a very valuable product. But you have to understand really the, 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 the playing field that you're launching the product out to as well. Fantastic. And one last question, but before I do, just want to remind all our viewers today that we'll be starting a podcast, which is the Irish Innovation Show, and both our guests today will be on that show as the first and second guest. And before I move on to the last question, it's a fantastic question, and it's aimed at you, Martin. And it's you mentioned this, that you're a newcomer to a field. And the question is, how are decision makers in that market, so that new market that you're coming to, how do they react to you when you have no scar tissue, no experience in that field, and you bring in a brand new product? So how do they accept you? So we've only a couple of minutes, so maybe if we keep this answer short, great question. So I suppose that if you think in the ventilator market, there's many major players out there for years. And then there's new players that come in to try and help solve this challenge, like, like the Dysons, the GSEBs, the General Motors. But the one thing about, I, I, I have to say, based on the reaction we have heard, because we are, are adding an attachment to an existing ventilator, and it's very simple to prove it works, it's very hard for them to argue against it. While if we had have went and designed a ventilator from ground up, they could have a hundred reasons why the combi lift ventilator won't succeed because you know it's not proven, it doesn't have the cycle test. So I think the one thing is it's to try and get into a niche where you're not maybe standing on the toes of the major brands, and 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 you know what they're going to let you get on with what you're doing. And it's the same when we're investing in forklift trucks, we don't plan to make regular forklift trucks. We're not standing on the toes of the big brands making regular forklift trucks, but we're nibbling away at their market segment where we're solving customer challenges. But the more smaller the niche you focus on, the better chance we as Irish companies can become the dominant brand worldwide. And we all know if you're the dominant brand in the market you're playing in, you have much better chances of being successful. Fantastic. And just a reminder to everybody watching, all the slides and the recording of this webinar will be available and you can also find out more on globalambition.ie and the irishadvantage.com so that's it for today's webinar innovation in a crisis i'd like to thank our guest ceo of combilift martin mcvicker cto chief technology officer of hydrogen diagnostic dr gary keating senior executive for innovation at enterprise ireland david keely and all the team that's worked on this webinar behind the scene seeing Denise Penny, Marika McCarville, thank you very much. And to you, the viewer, thanks for joining us and see you soon. Thank you very much, Aidan. Thank you. Bye.